But this morning I want to do something very, very different. Um, I'm not going to preach a sermon to you today. You're going to see a living version of one, okay? So be prepared for some interesting stories. And be prepared to listen once again to the voice of the call of God. You have been called by God. Isn't that amazing? You, all of you, for a special purpose. Would you welcome Dr. Brian Woodford? Come on up, Brian. Okay, let's give him a clap. And, uh, all right, come on up here. You've got your bag of tricks with you, okay. Now remember to turn on your microphone. Remember the little button? And come and have a seat here. I said to Brian this morning, I said, who's driving the bus? Uh, and, you know, he said, you. And I said, no, no, no. I think, I hope it's Jesus, actually. I'm just the passenger. <laughs> yeah, you're a passenger. Right, are you turned on? Have you got, got him on? Yes, I Okay, I've got a nod. You know, there's an interesting verse in the Bible, and it's found in uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 15. And Paul is talking about spiritual fathers in the faith. For even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father. For I became your father in Christ when I preached the good news to you. So I urge you, Paul says, imitate me. There's a lack of fathers, spiritual fathers in the church today, isn't there? How many of you have got spiritual fathers? This is my spiritual father. I am his Timothy. Years ago, and we might get onto this a little bit, he became my spiritual father. And our lives have gone very different directions, but always in ministry. And now at the end of life, we find ourselves back together again. So welcome, Brian. And what I want to do today is, you're, you're on, you're already gone, aren't you? You don't need to hold this. I want, want to start a little bit for, for you to tell us, you were a young man when God said something to you about calling you to a life of ministry and perhaps even Africa. Tell us a bit about that. When I was 10, um, I was living in Bristol in England. It was during the war and uh, I got the mumps. I think it was the mumps. And I had to stay in bed and that wasn't uh, very good for a 10 year old. So my mother went out with an aim of keeping me where I was, or supposed to be, and she bought me a book. And uh, I brought it with me. I read a bit of it yesterday, first time in 80 years. And uh, Tales from Livingston by Joyce Reason, published in 1941. And there I was, 10 years old, in bed in 1943, and I read this book. And I thought, wow. There's David Livingston, traveling across Africa, getting attacked by lions, setting slaves free, having all sorts of adventures and impossible features and tasks in front of him but showing tremendous determination to keep moving forward. And he did that. In fact, he walked all the way from South Africa up from Botswana, where he was first living, right across the Sahara, across the Kalahari Desert, and then right across to Luanda in the West Coast, and right through to the East Coast of Africa. Finally, ending back in Britain, found himself a hero because he was the first person on earth to have ever made that journey through Central Africa, which until that time had been just a blank on the maps of the world. I read that book, and uh, it was written for children, obviously, and I lay back on my pillow, and I said, oh God, I'd like to be a missionary in Africa like David Livingston. <laughs> and immediately, I heard a voice. All right, then you shall be. 
said, who said that? I looked at the ceiling and the cracks in the ceiling and there wasn't nobody there. But I heard the voice. And I, I knew this, this had to be God. Mum and Dad were believers. And so I'd grown up with the knowledge of God. But I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't, didn't come to, to Christ for another five years at least. But I knew what I had to do with my life. I couldn't avoid it. Reading this book yesterday, I wouldn't have made that op- offer. Uh, <laughs> doesn't appeal to me at all, all the privations and sufferings that that man went through for Christ. But he wanted to reach out to those that had never heard. Never heard the name of Jesus. And somehow that became the motive of my life as well. So that was, that was when you were a young man. You came to Christ, you were living in England... And then something happened between there and when you said, Lord, I'll train through WEC, the Worldwide Evangelization Crusade Ministry Organization. What happened? How, how did that come about? And, and, and how long did that take? It's interesting that this takes a while. This whole call of God doesn't just happen overnight, does it? It's quite, it takes a while to cook. I knew I had to go to Africa as a missionary, and I was rather suspicious that I would have to build my own house. But everything I made sort of tended to fall over. So uh, I decided when I left school at 15, my parents couldn't afford to keep me in school any longer, that I would become somehow an architect or something to do with building. The way didn't open up for that, but I did become a quantity surveyor, for those of you who've ever heard that term, and uh, got my qualifications in that after five years, and learned how to build houses. And then the next step was obvious, Bible college. And uh, I'd heard about WEC, uh, and uh, its vision to reach the unreached peoples of the world, and so I applied to the WEC Missionary Training College up in Glasgow and uh, got accepted, went there. Amazingly, at that time, the British government paid for all tertiary education, so it was free of charge. I only had to hitchhike from Bristol to Glasgow. I think it's 386 miles, however much that is in kilos. Took me 16 hours regularly each way for all my terms back and forth hitchhiking to and fro, but it came a point where I had no money and I was joining a mission that was a mission of faith. You are supposed to believe in God for your supply. And I thought, well, how's this going to work? I had no no washing powder to wash my socks. Some of the other students had washing powder and I thought, well, I better not steal theirs. I wanted to write a letter to my folks back in Bristol, but I had no money for a stamp. I thought, well, this is supposed to be a faith mission. Over the entrance is a big sign that says, have faith in God. So I went to my room and I prayed that night, Lord, what shall I do? I need some money. Will you please send me some money for a stamp and uh, some soap? And so I read. Um, I came to, I was reading... Psalm 55, and I came to verse 16, verse 16 and 17. I will call upon the Lord and he will hear me. Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud, and the Lord will hear my voice. And I thought, wow, that's pretty clear. That's what I have to do. Well, this was the evening, so I prayed, asking the Lord for some funds. Got up in the morning and prayed the same prayer. And it says, and at noon, so I thought I'd better do that. So I went back to my room and prayed again, went down, and there was the letter for me in the mail that came at midday. The only letter in my whole two years at college that ever came by the noon mail. And I opened the letter, and there, of course, was a postal order, I think, for 10 shillings or something like that. That was my first experience of really trusting God for my material needs. It was only a small amount, but it encouraged me that God would hear my prayers. I finished college 
And part of that was linguistics because Wycliffe Bible translators were running language programs in the UK. So I went to that during the summer vacation. Did very well there. Got to be involved in their teaching staff, teaching linguistics. And uh, then did my candidate period in WEC. They weren't very sure about accepting me. I got turned down the first time. One of their senior... Whoa, whoa, whoa. just a minute. So you, you, you do all this training and you apply to a mission and then they say no. And, and you're a single man with no money and yet you've got this idea that God wants you to go to Africa. Is that right? Have I got it right? I yeah. missed something too. Oh, you did. While I was at Bible College, a missionary came from Africa from a country called Upper Volta. Those of you who are old enough will know where that was, just south of the Sahara Desert in the savannah. And he'd been working there for about 15 years and had seen almost no harvest, no fruit at all in his tribe where he was working, in the Lobi tribe. And he came, and I think he wept as he told us how hard it was to live there and how long they'd preached and longed to see some response. But he said, there is one man that is a believer, but he's not a Lobi. He doesn't live among us. He lives in the neighboring tribe called the Birifor. He was converted back in the 1930s. He's been a Christian now for about 15 years, and he's still waiting for someone to come and teach him and follow up that first visit from the missionary. And when he talked about that, something gripped me. And I thought, well, maybe that's where God wants me to go. This man's name, he said, was Samba. So I prayed about it. And as I read the scriptures, I came to Acts chapter 7, verse 34. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have come down to deliver them. Now come, I will send you into Egypt. And God said, that's you. I knew. I got turned down. Yes, I did. This gentleman came up and with another man to explain the reason why. Very simple. Too much of Brian Woodford and not enough of Jesus Christ. Wow. Well. What should I do? He said, you have two options. You can stay another three months or you can go home. What would you do? I only had one option, that was to stay. And I got accepted in the end. Then, of course, I had to get French because this was now a French colony, Upper Volta, north of the Ivory Coast. And so I went home and wondered how I would get to France to learn French with no money. And uh, then God said, now I want you to go to the WEC headquarters, don't stay at home. So there I went to the nearest WEC regional headquarters where I knew the folks very well. And a couple of days after I got there, a missionary from France came through. He'd been on a speaking tour in the UK, and he said, I'm going back to France in a week's time, 10 days' time, two weeks' time. I'll take you with me. I'm going in my car, I'm going to fly over the channel, and I can drive you through to Paris. I thought that would be perfect. But I've got no money, and I've got to go to France for a year or maybe two to learn French. I had some school French, but that doesn't really work, does it? I said, Lord, if you want me to go to France with this man, Max Weber, please give me 50 pounds by next Friday. <laughs> this was on isn't the Friday. Isn't this cool? Isn't this good? <laughs> You've got lots more coming yet. <laughs> on Monday, somebody gave me 20 pounds, and I was amazed. And bit by bit through the week, money kept coming in. This is for you, this is for you. By Friday, I had 47 pounds. Close. But it came bedtime, and I still had 47 pounds. And I said, the devil could give me 47 pounds, but only you, God, could give me 50. 
and I went to bed, and I was trying to go to sleep, when the phone rang. And sure enough, it was for me. A lady on the line, a lady that I knew who'd been in our WEC prayer meetings, she says, the Lord has told me you are asking for a specific amount of money. Tell me how much it is, and I'll put it to the post in the morning. I said, three pounds. She said, is that all? I thought it would be much more than that. I said, no, that's all. I had my 50 pounds. I went to France, and that, I learned that, French. But that is a very key moment, isn't it? I mean, when someone offers to give you a whole lot of money, and you take three pounds, that's, that's pretty awesome. Because that's been authentic, isn't it? That there's, a, there's something deep right, yeah. And, and why I point that out is because this principle of provision and supply was to become a major theme of your life, even still now. Yeah, um, absolutely. And it started right there. Absolutely. Anyway, carry on. I went to France. Fortunately, I got invited to a family of a student at college uh, and uh, was invited to work on the farm for a month. And she met me when I arrived, and I said, hello, and she said goodbye, and she left. So I was left with a family that didn't speak a word of English, and I didn't speak a word of French. So I couldn't find my way to the bathroom. I couldn't do anything. But I had to figure out how to survive, and that happened with signs and wonders and the loving family that they had three boys, I think, and mum and dad. And a day or two after I got there, I was walking just down the road outside the house, looking at the swallows on the telephone line. And I'm a bird watcher, so I was interested in looking at these swallows. And I was thinking about them in English. And I said, that's no good. I'm supposed to be learning French. Unless I can think in French, I'll stop thinking. So I did. I didn't think very much at all for several days. <laughs> at the end of a month, a family came and visited for a meal. English people who didn't speak much French, and I had to interpret for them. But I couldn't speak English. I was stuck in French. I was fluent after one month because I'd immersed myself in the language. That's amazing. I had to go back to Paris and do my studies and get my qualifications of the Alliance Francaise in French language and literature. Did that. And uh, then I was ready to leave for Africa. And I went on a boat in those days, 19, what was it, 1959, on the ship, two weeks, wonderful. Arrived in Ghana, which was on the coast below Upper Volta. Yeah, there it is. Six weeks in Ghana waiting for a visa. That's another story experienced missionary life at the high level and the low level. And I found that Weckers lived at the low level. Got my way up to Burkina Faso, as it now is. It used to be Upper Volta. And uh, was accommodated by a wonderful Canadian couple, young missionaries who were grieving over the loss of their two-year-old daughter they'd, they'd just buried three weeks before, who died of malaria. They'd been there for, I think, 10 years. The other missionary that I'd heard at Bible College was still there. He'd now been there 20 years, working among the Lobi people. I said, how many believers are there? Maybe five, probably just four, after more than 20 years. But then the Birifor tribe were totally unreached. At that time, something about 90 or 100,000, living in the bush. One road went in, but it was, they called it a road, but it was only an occasional road. You couldn't tra travel across it in the wet season. Broken bridges and mud and sand. But that's where Samba lived. And I went to find him. That's where you're going. Off you go. And I found him. 
Did he have an elephant tied his leg? Was that the same man? That was Alakum. Alakum, okay. That's See, another I, story. I know some stories, but that's another story. Forget it was Alakum. so wonderful to meet Samba. Yeah. I didn't know his story then, but I'll tell it to you now because he told me it a little bit later when I could understand enough to hear, understand what he was saying in his native beautiful language. He came to the Lord in 1937 from a visit on one occasion from an Irish missionary who preached through an interpreter. And he believed in the creator God whose name was Jesus. And because he believed in this creator God whose name was Jesus, he had some contact with him and he could have no other gods. And so he destroyed his idols and was waiting for some more teaching. He waited seven years and nobody came. And then he started to pray, Lord, send someone to teach me. And he still waited. And he waited. And he waited 16 years until I arrived. I was 26. When he first prayed, yeah. I was 10. <laughs> Wasn't that the day that I read that book? Yeah. And God spoke to me. Amazing. And we met. Yeah. Prayers get answered. Sometimes they take a long time. And that's me in the picture. Can you see it? We've got another picture coming up, I think, of Samba. Have I? No, that's, no, that's me. That's another one. We'll go back to that in a minute. Samba. Go on, another one. Another one. There you go. Samba's in the middle there. He's got clothes on this time. Okay. <laughs> no, that's okay. All right, there he is. Years later, eh? Well, my first job was to learn the language. Yeah. Let's leave that picture on for the moment. And um, from my experience in learning French, I knew what the technique should be. No English. Well, I had a cat, and I spoke English to the cat until they stole it and ate it. Um, <laughs> And I was trying to <laughs> learn words, and I'd go from house to house and to the marketplace, picking up words, getting a few sentences, trying to write them down. The language had never been written, and as far as I know, no one in the world had ever learnt it from the outside world. Okay, so, so you, you learn the language by just watching, trying out words, and jumping up and down, and smiling, and picking up something and listening to what they say and all that kind of stuff? No, it wouldn't work like that. Okay. I was in the marketplace, pointing at something and trying to get the word, and a lovely deep bass voice behind me said, you don't say it like that, you say it like this. And I looked around, and there was this tall man on the left of that picture holding the book. His name is Copter. I was amazed. This was the only man in the village who spoke French. But he was interested in his own language. And after some persuasion, he came and agreed to come and help me and teach me. So every morning he came. And every morning, I got out my little daily light, this book, scripture readings. And as he came, this is the same book, by the way, I uh, opened it to the page and I read a scripture verse in English and then translated it into my best French so that he could perhaps get something of the word of God. Later on we tried to translate it again into Birifor, but that took a while. We worked together every morning for about three or four months. One day we were translating, I was collecting proverbs, proverbs in the language, which are so important. And we came to a proverb that said this, the goat cannot cross the river, but its skin goes across. In Birifor. I said, when would you, what does that mean? When would you use a proverb like that? Well, he said, the Volta River, which divides us from Ghana, is 15 kilometers away, is too wide for the goat to swim across. But when we kill the goat, we make its bag 
as his, his skin into a sack. And we put it on our shoulder and we get into a canoe and the skin goes across. I said, oh, and when would you use a proverb like that? He said, oh, it's like me and my father. My father never heard what you're telling me. I said, you mean you want to cross? He said, yes. We prayed and he accepted Christ right there at the translation table. What I didn't know then, and he told me a little later, he said, I believed because I'd heard the message before. I was in Vietnam, conscripted by the French to fight in their war, and I got invalided out into a hospital. And I was put in a bed and they asked me what I was. Was I a Buddhist? Was I a Catholic? Was I a Hindu? He said, I didn't know what any of it was. I thought I'd better say yes to something. So when they came to Protestant, I said yes. <laughs> so I had Protestant on my bed. And a missionary came in and saw that this man was a Protestant and invited him to the meeting. And there he heard the same message they'd heard from me. God's preparation. Travel along the story a little bit, and we go back a couple of slides, and we've got this lady here. Now, anyone that's not married, you're going to hear a story now on how to find a wife. Um, bit of an interesting one, isn't it? Of how you felt she was the lady for you. When and she was 19, yeah, yes. Eh? When she was 19, 10 years before this. Before that. And you knew that you were going to marry each other, but... Your paths hadn't hardly crossed. We didn't meet. No. How did you finally make it with her? You know? I was a candidate when she came to the headquarters. Her dad and mum and dad were emigrating from the UK to New Zealand, become the New Zealand directors of WEC. And uh, eventually their daughter followed them. But there in, in the UK, in London, at the headquarters, Miriam played the piano and sang beautifully. She was a trained singer. And I thought, wow, this is a lovely girl. I'd really like to marry her. And I was just leaving for Africa. I thought, well, no, she's not even started her nursing training. Or maybe she had, but then she'll have to go to Bible college. It will be years before she could be a missionary. And maybe she wouldn't want to come to my country. So forget it. So I forgot it. When I came back on my first furlough, four and a half, five years later, there was a greeting from her. She hadn't forgotten me after all. Well, that was encouraging. <laughs> when I was due to leave another year later, by this time she was in New Zealand, and I heard a message through her auntie, who was another wet missionary. She had a call from God to come to Burkina Faso. I thought, wow, God's working. So we began to write. Letters went back and forth for a month or two. And then my field director in Burkina said, you shouldn't be writing to this girl. You're not engaged and she might have wrong ideas. So I had to be obedient and we stopped writing. I said, this is the last letter you're ever going to get from me and sent it off. As she was leaving New Zealand, leaving Auckland to go to Switzerland to learn French, her dad gave her this last letter of mine, thinking what a nice letter it would be. So she says she was leaving New Zealand to go to Paris, or go to France, uh, no, Switzerland, and uh, there's my letter to say I'm not going to write anymore. So we didn't, until she came finally two, two years later out to Burkina. And there she was put on one mission station, and I was in, in the Birifor tribe, and we couldn't meet because there was no reason for me to go until somebody wanted to borrow my Land Rover. So that was an excuse. And uh, I got there and finally we met and uh, said hello. And it took us 10 days to get engaged. Yeah. <laughs> the old Land Rover trick, eh? <laughs> wow. Desperation, eh? That's good. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that good? And then you, 10 days courting and kind of you know, shall we do this? And we married the scripture where, is it? Um, 
who wanted a wife? Was it Isaac wanted a wife? And they sent the messenger, Abraham sent the messenger. Yeah, he had to go and work for her. That's right. And uh, what was the girl's response? Shall, shall you go with this man? And she said, something about, I don't have a choice. The thing proceedeth from the Lord, it says. Yeah. So that was what we put in our engagement ring or in wedding ring. The thing proceeds from the Lord. There it came go. from the Lord. So any of you that are single, there's, you know, but it took a few years again. All these stories, they take years and years and years, don't sure. they, to happen. And that's, that's part of the theme of, of your life, that you just keep serving God and somehow he makes a way. Along comes Miriam. You're married. She joins you in the ministry. And your life changes in some ways, doesn't it? You stay in Bikina. Should I tell you a little bit about how, how the church started? A little bit, yep, and then we'll move on. Yep, how the church started and grew, and, and church planting. You planted a whole bunch of churches. My language teacher, Kopta, had an older brother, and he was still an idolater. All the people had idols at their houses, big idols. And it was demon power, very clearly. Kopta had been a player of the xylophone, the... Uh, Balafon, which is the African xylophone. And you can only play that at funerals if you're inspired by the spirits, by the demons. So when he became a believer, he stopped. His brother still had the idols, and he was responsible for them as the older brother. One day he was making a sacrifice, and the demons somehow got hold of him, and he just went off his head. Ran from the house, left all his clothes, and was eating human excrement in the bush. Fortunately, when he arrived 15 kilometers away near the river, another Christian was there who'd come to the Lord the same time that I had arrived and was now preaching the gospel, very poorly, but preaching the gospel, and he knew the power of the Holy Spirit, and he cast out the demon from Dapala, this man, and uh, gave him some clothes, and uh, he came back to his house to see Copta and his elders. And the elders said, you've made a mistake with your idol worshipping. You've made this error. Now you have to make a bigger and better sacrifice to, to, to uh, get permission. He said, no, I've had enough. And he went to Kopta, his brother, and said, I want to believe too. I can see you're free from the, em from the demons and the power of the idols. I want to believe too. So he became a believer. Came to see me with his little boy who was burning up with a fever. He said, would you pray for my little boy? So I went out and prayed for the little boy and sent him off home. And I wondered if God would hear my prayer because I forgot to take my hat off when I prayed. The next day, Dapala was back with his little boy, fits and well. He said, as soon as I got home, he was well and is wonderful. He said, I've given him a new name. His name is Mayi. Mayi. Cut and come out. He said, because I've cut myself off from the idols and I've come out. That, that's Acts of the Apostle stuff, isn't it? Six months later, isn't that cool? Copter got sick. Yeah. I sent him off to the hospital in the, in the town, five hours drive away. Two weeks later, I got a message to say that he'd died. And he's dead. Wow. That's what broke me up. And I wept. I was in my house. Of course, the local people accused me of killing him because I'd drawn him away from his idols and his idols had killed him. His one particular idol called Masep. Tears were coming down and I was saying, Lord, I think I want to leave. I've had enough. Copter was my only friend, if you like. He was my key man. And God spoke to me again. He said, you see that bare earth out there? The rain coming down, it looks so barren. The seed has been sown in that ground and it's preparing for a harvest. Wait, three or four months that ground will be covered in food, life for this village. You stay here and I will bring the harvest. I said, okay, Lord, I'll stay. Then I went to the funeral for Copter at his house. And they tried to put on traditional funeral. Body wrapped up in the sleeping mat, put on the heads of two men, one at the front and one at the back, and the shaman or the fetish priest, if you like, 
comes with a stick and questions the body and taps it on the head. If the answer is yes, it rolls violently to the right. If the answer is no, it rolls to the left. And I watched that several times and it's absolutely, the men holding it don't move at all, standing, balancing on their heads, but you can see the, the demonic power at work there. And the xylophone players have to play proverbs on the xylophone inspired by the spirits. They had this funeral and it wouldn't work. They tried for two hours to get the body to move. The xylophone players say, we, said, we can't, we can't play with no inspiration. At the same time, there were 12 of us, I think, the young believers, the first, sitting on the roof of Dappler's house, Copter's house, it was, thanking the Lord for the life and praying, and Dappler sang a song. The first song ever written in the language. I'd been praying for someone to come and write songs. Come and hide me, come and hide me. Jesus, hide me from evil. I'm alone in wanting to follow the Lord who loved me and sent the Comforter. Wonderful words. And immediately the whole group of 12 began to repeat it and sing. And this was the first song ever written, or not written, <laughs> sung in the beautiful language. So Dapple then became the leader of the church. And that's really how the church began. First song in the language. Yes. I will sing it, but I won't. You know? And and this is serious, you know, confrontation of evil over darkness, isn't it? This is this, was this the is land the of, demonic, land of idolatry, really before your eyes, right out there, West Africa. And this guy comes out from England, and and Miriam joins you, That's right. together with about fifteen believers. And then we began to get the girls coming. Planted, she ran the girls' yes. program, and uh, the people began came, to grow. believers came, churches began to be planted. Amen. How many years did you stay with Miriam in Burkina Faso planting churches? Not long, not long. I think um, we married in 68 and we left in 71, so three years. Three years. Most of the time I was single. And, and where did you go to next? Miriam was from New Zealand by that time. So we went to England and then my first visit to New Zealand, arrived in 72. Her parents were here. Her parents Came to were Auckland. directors of the work mission, yeah. 72, that's where we met. Elders in the About church there. at Valley Road yeah. Baptist. And I was a young guy, pretty rough, and you took me under your wing. You gave your testimony, certainly shortly after you, were, you came to the Lord, in the church at Valley Road. And you got up and you gave your testimony and God spoke to me then and said, this man is for the ministry. So I knew I had to get to yeah. know you. <laughs> you were driving a bus at that time, oh, I think, yes. to and from the airport. And trucks and having crashes. And didn't and God speak to you about giving that up? Yeah. And came along and Brian sent me these little Bible studies. and. Well, you applied to the college and they turned you down. Yeah, well, that's another story. And I said, no problem. <laughs> I'm not surprised. No, no problem. They did. We'll work together. Yeah. That's how yeah. you started. You know, sometimes when God calls us, obstacles come in our way, don't they? That, that doesn't Always. all go right. It doesn't all go easy. Always. And in, in these stories that Brian's telling... I hope you're noticing the number of times, first of all, how long stuff takes to happen, how confrontational the gospel is in culture, and, and how God does promise. He comes through, but you've got to hang in there. You've got to be persistent. Absolutely. You've got to listen to the voice of the Spirit and watch what God's doing. Eh? And um, you sent me these studies, and you said, read the book of whatever, book of the Bible, and write a one-page summary of it. And when you've done it, come back and we'll talk. We prayed together as and, well. And we prayed, and, and that was my Bible study. That was how I started. And then I applied again for college, and they decided I'm going to take me. And, and we, we started college. But those years were amazing. They and were I remember you, you had a black car, and you used to take me home and feed me lunch. And one of the things that amazed me was about how God provided for you and Miriam. You had no money, no income. And this principle of provision has come all the way right through your life, all traveling all over the world, coming back to here to New Zealand, living, putting petrol in the car, 
bread and butter on the table, everything, everything you prayed was, for. Um, yeah. And then, of course, Miriam died. Well, that's another story. She died. No, before that was going to Ghana, you wasn't it? went to it? Ghana to Kumasi. Can I talk about that? Sure, Can briefly, we... and then we'll get on to that. I had a letter from WEC asking me to go to Ghana to teach in the new college they just opened for training of African missionaries and pastors. So I said yes. And then regretted it straight away when I discovered what Ghana was like. Had a military junta, had about a thousand percent inflation each year. It was just in a real mess. Who would want to go there when I was in New Zealand here with an amazing ministry, I saw it myself, God was blessing in amazing ways among young people. I was with the TSCF up and down the country in all the universities as their missions representative. We had a hundred in the youth group at Valley Road. Yeah. Why leave this ministry? And I said, Lord, do you mind if I draw back? I thought, well, I better get a clear message from God about this. So I had a half a day of prayer and fasting and went down to a little hut by the Manukau, praying and uh, reading Hebrews, because I hadn't read that book for a long time. Got to chapter 10. The just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. I thought, wow. <laughs> live the rest of my life and God has no pleasure in me? I can't do that. Lord, I will go. I don't want to go, but I'll go. But Lord, I haven't got any money. <laughs> Big smile. Don't have to. I can't go. Well, maybe, Lord, you're going to provide. Lord, if you give me $800 or pounds, I think it was then, I'll be able to go via Australia and visit my brother-in-law. But I'd like to go to Thailand and Paris and Israel and Kathmandu and a few places on the way. That would cost 1,200 pounds. Whatever you give, we'll do that. Came 10 o'clock at night, I walked back to my accommodation, staying with a dear friend, lady, farmer, wife, and uh, she was in the paddock coming to look for me with, Mir with uh, Miriam, the two of them together. We walked back to the house, torchlight looking for carpets on the way. And she said, oh, by the way, the Lord has just told me to give you 1,200 pounds. <laughs> I said, why? She said, well, I thought 600, and then God said each. <laughs> I said, well, did you know we were thinking of going back to Africa? No, she said. Again, yeah. God's provision. So I had to go. And uh, when I got to Africa, I started to worry. I couldn't possibly live on my income that was coming in. And then I read in Matthew about the sin of worrying about food and clothes. And I apologized. I realized that worry was a sin. Worrying about money was sinful. And I repented. I've never worried about money since. And God has always provided. Provided for us there in Ghana, amazingly. That's the Bible, the Birifor Bible. The Birifor Bible. Yes, I translated the Bible. half of it when I was there in the 70s, 60s. And then, that's right, when Miriam passed away, we were in the Philippines when she was discovered to have cancer and got our surgery there. 15 months later, she passed away in Auckland. I think the day before she passed away, I knew she was going to be going, and I said, Lord, what of the future? What happens now? Here I am, no children, no money, no job, no country. I didn't have a New Zealand passport then. And I remembered that I was a son of God, child of God, so why worry? And God gave me Hebrews 11, verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I can have the future by faith. So I reached out my hand as I walked down the road and said, Lord, I'll take it. The rest of my life, I'll take it. Receive it by faith. Whatever you want. Well, you said no children. You, you, you couldn't have children with Miriam. Miriam had four miscarriages. And Great loss. Yeah. Tough. 
But when she died, I said to the Lord, Lord, I enjoyed that being married to Miriam. I bet you couldn't do it again. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And how old were you now? This is another almost Abraham story. I was 51. Yeah, 51. So I was driving down Dominion Road in Auckland in my little Hillman Minx. Yeah, black. Black one. And I heard the voice. You will marry Lynn Franklin in Burkina Faso. I said, oh, I better get to know this girl. <laughs> and here she is. So the first thing we did when we got married was to have a child. And that child was the New Testament. Miriam had learned the beer of... Uh, Lynn had learned the... Get my wives mixed up sometimes. Uh, Lynn had learned the beer for language and was living there. So I went back and joined her for two years. And in two years, we translated the whole New Testament. And that's what we have here. Um, no, that's not it. Did you get that? The whole of the New Testament in Birafor. Published by the Barber Society. You know, 1993. with their help. Yeah. Time has gone, I'm and, sorry. And then something amazing happened. Look. I had a lovely daughter. One of my desires, God granted. My lovely daughter, Hannah. Yes. There she is. So together, they finally had a daughter, and God gave Brian family. Yes. How many years did you wait for that, for her? 40, 30 years? I was 56 when she was born. Yeah. Mm. And along she comes. But it's not over yet. Then you also did some more study, didn't you? Study to show yourself approved unto God. Why did you do that? I mean, you've... You've had this remarkable life. You've gone out as a missionary. You've gone to a tribe, learned the language, translated the gospel, written the Bible, had it translated, printed, married a woman, lived all over the world, traveled, and because now you're Wick, going to go to study. Wick had asked me to become international director for their training programs, and there were two big needs in WEC that I could see at that time, just after I married Lynn. Um, one was leadership, we were losing too many people because our leaders weren't adequately trained. And the other was we were church planting with no guidelines about how to plant a church in another culture. Right. And so the WEC asked me, I would already done my MA in theology so that I could teach in Ghana, go back to Fuller Seminary in the States and uh, do my doctorate in ecclesiology especially and uh, write about that. So that's what I did. So you majored in... What is the church, yeah. and how does church happen? How do we be the church, That's right. What is regardless the church? of culture? There are many books on how to plant churches, yeah. but no book on what the church is. is. And it seemed to me that unless you know what it is, you're working in, in, in the dark. And you hold a doctorate from Fuller, Missiological, Fuller Theological College on what the church is. That's right. So then I wrote your book. finally put As my dissertation did. into a little book called Master Plan. And uh, you've got a slide of that, I think. I don't know. Did if you had. put it up or not? The one I sent. That's your family. That's my family today. No, that's the book there. That's the book there. Um, well, Always learning, eh, Brian? Always learning. And now, one last question. The seasons of life have come and gone. The call of God has come and stayed. Always, yes. You still are passionate about God and the church. How do you sustain passion into your older years? Many of us here are getting through the numbers. How do you sustain? You've got this great love for God and this great passion for God that's never left you. It's, it's, it's what I admired in you. To me, the secret is choosing God over myself, always. Um, Job 28, 28. Because all people are supposed to be wise. So that's a verse for us. The fear of the Lord is true wisdom. To forsake evil is real understanding. I like that. To live in the fear of the Lord. If you fear the Lord, you want to leave the bad stuff. 
the self. You're willing to die so that Jesus can live. Saying yes to Jesus and no to myself. And, and that still is with me, very much so. But the, the benefit of that is, of course, if you agree to die, you then really live because it's the life of Jesus that flows through. And that, to me, is the great joy. Psalm 91, verse 1, I think it is. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Imagine living in the shadow of the Almighty. That's perfect rest and peace. There's joy, the joy of what lies before, the joy of hope for the glory that is to come, all of that. Yeah. I think for me, practically speaking, it's keeping close to the Word of God, yeah. reading the Scriptures in the morning. With, together we read it, Lynn and I, and praying together. Then right after breakfast I have my own reading, New Testament, the one year Bible, the Old Testament another year, so I get through the whole Bible in two years. Time with the Lord, the Scriptures, day by day, absolutely essential. The other thing, being retired, I have a chance to listen to great preachers, preachers like um, N.T. Wright, mm. um, Alistair Begg. Yeah. They are inspirational to me many times. Yeah. Well, we've come to the end of our interview. Have you enjoyed it? It's been awesome, hasn't it? Thank you, Brian. You know, Brian said, don't put me on a pedestal. Amen. And, and we won't. Um, but we also need to honour our elders, don't we? There's, um, sadly, in the church these days, often older people are overlooked and missed, and we don't tend to listen to their stories. And there's some remarkable stories out there to today. You've heard one of them. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for Brian and Miriam and Lynn. Thank you, Lord, that, that when Brian gave his heart and life to you, he never dreamed of what would come, and his life story is unrolled before him as he's trusted you over the years. Sometimes it's been through heartache and loss and disappointment, but in the midst of that, you've met him. And you've steered his life along a wonderful pathway. And fruit has come. We thank you that today the Birifor tribes and churches are strong. And they have the gospel and the New Testament and the Old Testament. And you are building your church among this tribe of people in Africa. Lord, all because one man said, yes, I'll go. Seen me. And he never gave up. Now, Lord, dismiss us with your blessing and call us to follow you closely. Lord, I pray for people today who have heard this story and your spirit right now is saying to them, you, it's you. It's you I'm talking to today. Will you follow me? Will you trust me? Will you allow me to provide for your future? Thank you, Lord, that the only true answer is yes. Yes, Lord. For you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. We set aside and lay aside our idols. We will follow them no more. For you, Jesus, are our King. Thank you. Thank you. Amen.